Of all the bars in the world, he needed to go to mine. Well, it's not really my bar, but I often pop in there after work. Plato's place is my hideout, and I'm well acquainted with Tony, the bartender. I prefer to keep a low profile, so I wasn't thrilled to see him there. His name is Eugene Whistler. I've known him since high school. We exchanged greetings in passing several times, but I never had the desire to start a conversation with him. Sure, without a doubt, he seems like a decent man, but he is incredibly naive. All through school, he was constantly teased and bullied by other guys because they knew he couldn't stand up for himself. I remember once when we were freshmen in high school, I witnessed him being pushed by three seniors. I've always hated bullies, so I foolishly decided to step in. I got into the situation hoping that he would cover for me. Unfortunately, he ran away like a frightened animal. When he finally returned with the teacher, I was left lying on the ground with a bloody nose, a swollen lip, and two bruises under my eyes. While I was sitting in my favorite bar, wondering if I should leave, Tony noticed me and put my beer next to Eugene. Despite my desire to leave, I remembered my mother's instructions about politeness and greeted Eugene with a simple, Hello, Eugene. How are you? He turned to me, tears in his eyes. Chase? Hi, hi. I just came in for a beer, that's all. What are you doing here? The same as you. I was just planning on having a drink before heading home. I didn't want to admit that I was a regular here. Without thinking, I asked him why he looked upset. He didn't answer right away, just stared into his beer. I hoped he hadn't heard me, but eventually he said, My wife is cheating on me and I do not know what to do. Divorce seems like an obvious solution, I replied. Are you sure? Or is it just a suspicion? Oh no, it really is. She's with him at this very moment. They really kicked me out of my own house to be alone, he said. I exclaimed in disbelief, almost choking on my beer. You've got to be kidding, I said with a nervous giggle, hoping it was some kind of bad joke. Instead, he just stared into his glass, confirming my worst fears. Did they kick you out of your own house? Seriously? I asked, feeling a mixture of anger and pity for my friend. With a bashful nod of his head, he confirmed my suspicions. Yeah, it's the same Eugene, I thought to myself, realizing that he hadn't changed a bit since school days. It was frustrating to see him make the same mistakes over and over again. I couldn't understand how this could happen. This man clearly needed help, I thought to myself, but it shouldn't have come from me. I made a conscious decision not to interfere this time. So you're sitting here feeling sorry for yourself while your wife is cheating on you with some jerk in your own house in your own bed, Eugene? His reply interrupted me before I could speak. But what can I do? What is it? He asked, suspecting my possible offers. I just shook my head in disbelief. Not only has he not learned from his past mistakes, but he also seems to have become even worse than he was. What do you want to do? I asked. I have a desire to just throw them both out of the house, but I can't stand up for myself, as you know. Chase, it would be very funny for my wife to see me beaten up, and besides, I work for Lisa's father. If she says the word, I'll be out of a job. And without a wife and a job, what will I have left? Well, you'd have something much more important left, I replied. He looked at me puzzled. What is it? He asked. Self-respect, I said. I became more and more upset about this situation, to the point where I had difficulty controlling my anger. Do you know what it's like? This is when you are confident in yourself, when you feel good about who you are. Are you feeling all right now? Which is more important to you? Staying with a wife who doesn't love or respect you, working at a job that undermines your self-esteem, or being able to walk down the street with your head held high? I hoped that my fiery speech would spur him to action, but he just sat there, not moving. It's always been easy for you, Chase. People admire you and look up to you. You've never been afraid of anyone, unlike me. I'm not as brave as you are. I admit I am a coward and always have been. I've never even been in a fight because I've always been running away. I doubt very much that I will suddenly become brave right now. My disappointment has reached its peak. 
What a pathetic brat. I got up, took a $20 bill out of my wallet and threw it on the bar. For both of us, I snapped at Tony. He just nodded and continued chatting with the pretty blonde at the other end of the bar. Let's go, I almost shouted, grabbing him by the collar and pulling him off the bar stool. Wait, wait, where are we going? He stuttered as I pulled him towards the door. To your house, you and I are going to teach someone a lesson, I growled. Oh, Chase, I don't think so. Shut up, Eugene. Get in the car and show me where you live, I demanded. Eugene looked scared as we drove, and I was afraid he would do something. Reluctantly, he brought me to his house. Where's the bedroom? I asked. Up the stairs, down the corridor to the left, he stammered. In a hurry, I grabbed him by the shirt and dragged him along. At the very top of the stairs, I looked into the hall and saw that the door to the bedroom was wide open. Such dishonorable behavior simply disgusted me. Clutching Eugene's shirt in my fist, I forcibly dragged him into the bedroom. The couple there were so engrossed in each other that they didn't notice us until we were next to each other. Eugene's wife screamed when I grabbed my lover by the hair and pulled him away from her and from the bed. Despite my grip, he managed to twist away and try to stab me in the head. But his movement was too limited, and the blow landed on my shoulder. Deciding not to give him the opportunity to strike again, I held him firmly in place. While Eugene's wife continued to scream, I quickly turned him around and delivered a powerful blow to the solar plexus. He collapsed to the floor, his trousers lying next to the bed. Taking advantage of the opportunity, I grabbed his wallet from his pocket and pulled out his license, clutching them to me. Then I noticed his phone partially sticking out of his pocket. Eugene's wife's voice pierced the air with hysteria. Who is this man? Eugene froze in place, unable to comprehend the chaos unfolding in front of him. Eugene, I swear I'll spank you if you don't do anything. I shouted back at her to shut up while I searched for the number of this loser lover's wife. Finding the number marked as wife's number, I nervously dialed it. Hello, Mrs. Cutter. I'm sorry to break the bad news, but your husband has caused a real scandal here. Mrs. Cutter's voice on the other end was full of worry and confusion. Who is this? Why do you have my husband's phone number? Is he all right? What's happening? Looking at the motionless man, I calmly explained that I was a friend of a man with whose wife her husband had an affair. I had his phone because I found it in his trousers, which were abandoned in my friend's bedroom. Although he's fine so far, I warned her to keep a close eye on him. If he tries to do something to my friend's wife again, I won't hesitate to take harsh measures. Without waiting for an answer, I ended the conversation. I opened the camera on this phone and quickly took a picture of Eugene's wife before she could hide under the covers. Then I took another picture of her lover, who was starting to come to his senses. Without hesitation I sent both photos to Mrs. Cutter. The lover looked up in shock when he realized that I had his phone. What have you done? He begged. I just sent a picture of you two to your wife, I replied calmly. Despair filled his eyes and he begged, No, please, you can't. I have children. It's too late. The dawn has already come. You should have thought about the consequences before threatening and kicking a man out of his own house just to sleep with his wife. I hissed. I threw his trousers at him and said firmly, Get dressed and leave Eugene's house immediately. He looked at Lisa, who was still hiding under the covers, perhaps thinking that she still had some kind of power in this situation. Now, I growled, and if Eugene finds you with his wife again, I won't be so lenient next time. While he was hurriedly putting on his pants, I took a picture of his driver's license on my phone, put it back in my wallet, and threw it back to him. Here are your things, Mr. Arnold Cutter from 32 Landon Drive. Remember what I told you about coming back here. Without hesitation, he quickly left the room. I turned to Eugene, who was standing next to his bed, looking shocked. It's up to you now, Eugene. From me? Yes, I can't decide everything for you. You married her, so now you have to deal with her, I said harshly. That's it! Eugene's wife screamed, I'm calling the police! And what will you tell them? I replied. 
that your husband came home with a friend and found you in bed with another man? Come on. Maybe the local newspaper will pick it up and print it in the police report. I can already see the headline. The grocery store owner's daughter was found in a love nest. I couldn't believe it when I recognized her. Lisa Schultz. At least that was her maiden name. She went to school a year later than us. It was hard to believe that she was now married to Eugene. Her father owned two grocery stores in the area, and she often walked around them as if she were a queen. Okay, she replied irritably. Please leave the room so I can get dressed. Eugene, go with him. I glanced at her timid husband, watching his shoulders droop. He seemed so used to obeying orders that he didn't even realize it. Eugene, this is your house, your bedroom, and your wife, I reminded him. I'm going down, but if I were you, I wouldn't follow orders, I'd start giving them. I turned and headed back down the stairs, the echo of her screaming at him still ringing in my ears. I decided to take a beer from the fridge and wait to see who would come out victorious in their dispute. It was clear that she would win, but I stayed in case he needed to be taken to the hospital. I had no doubt that she would manage on her own. Sitting at the kitchen table, I listened to the heated exchange between Lisa and Eugene. Lisa seemed to be doing most of the talking, but from time to time Eugene's voice rose above hers. I wondered how many times he had raised his voice during their marriage. When I finished my beer, the commotion seemed to have subsided. I half expected her to come down the stairs with his lifeless body in tow. But when she finally appeared, she was alone. Her eyes scanned the room until they settled on me, and then she started walking towards me. Her gaze was like a deadly weapon and I knew I was in trouble. Eugene was probably lying dead upstairs and now she's come for me. I was hoping I could protect myself. What did you tell him? She growled, getting straight to the point. It's nothing special. He just said he had to learn to stand up for himself, I replied. She laughed in response. Yes, of course this will never happen, I continued. I advised him that in order to regain his self-respect, he should leave his unfaithful wife. She grinned back and said, Thanks to you, he is already preparing to leave. I hope you're happy with yourself. I looked at her confidently and replied, Yes, I'm quite satisfied. She remarked mockingly, You think you're smart, but mark my words, he won't be gone for long. I give him no more than three days before he crawls back begging for forgiveness, and when he does, I'll make sure he regrets it. He will be grateful to you for that. Despite the cocky grin, doubts began to creep into my mind as I considered her words. After all, she probably knew him better than I did. Suddenly my confidence wavered. At that moment, Eugene appeared at the bottom of the stairs with a suitcase in his hands. I saw him in the doorway, but Lisa had her back to him. Are you ready to go? I asked. Lisa turned to face him. Eugene Whistler, if you walk out that door, don't expect to come back, she warned. I held my breath, not knowing what he would say. After a moment's hesitation, Eugene finally spoke. I'm ready, Chase. I left the kitchen and headed for the front door. We were almost outside when we caught the end of her scream. I'm serious, Eugene. Don't bother coming back she shouted. I looked at him and saw the fear in his eyes. And now what? What is it? He asked, his voice trembling. His question brought to mind Lisa's words that he could crawl to her. I realized that I might have just completely ruined this poor guy's life. Even though the situation was already terrible, I knew she could make it even worse. Suddenly I was filled with doubts about whether I was making the right decision. We went back to the Play-Doh and I left him by the car. We agreed that he would spend the night at a motel. I told him to meet me at Play-Doh's the next evening at 7 o'clock. I offered to buy him his first beer. That night I barely fell asleep, doubting my decision and regretting getting involved in this story. I promised myself that I would never do that again. The next day, as usual, I arrived at Play-Doh's around 6. Tony opened the Millers for me and put it on the bar. How was your friend from yesterday? He looked a little depressed. I just took a sip from my long neck. He has problems at home, I replied. I didn't want to delve into this topic. If Eugene wanted others to know about his personal problems, 
he could have shared them himself. But I was interested in Tony's opinion. Have you ever been involved in other people's family problems? He gave me a puzzled look. I'm a bartender. It's part of the job, he replied with a grin. No, I mean really. Yesterday I played a role in his decision to leave his wife. She treated him badly, and I thought I was helping him by pushing him to leave. But now I'm starting to doubt my actions. What makes you doubt yourself? I thought for a moment before replying. I guess I think I went overboard. Thank God she's not my wife. I chuckled. I think it was her self-confidence that made me step in. She was so sure that he would come back to her. And if he returned, she vowed to make his life even more miserable. I probably should have stayed out of it from the beginning. I can say for sure that he's not on his knees right now, Tony said. Oh, I laughed. And why are you so sure? Melander's intuition. Besides, he just came in, he replied with a grin. I turned around to make sure that he really had come earlier, and he was smiling. Hi, Chase. Hi, Tony. The drinks are on me, he said, still grinning. Chase, tell me honestly. Do you think you could give me some fighting lessons? Why all this talk about a fight? Who are you going to fight with? I asked, perplexed. No one. I just want to be able to stand up for myself if I have to. I should have kicked that guy out of the house, not you. I want to be ready for the next time, he explained. I felt uneasy at the thought of the next time. Are you planning to go back to Lisa? I asked. He met my gaze, and for the first time I saw determination in his eyes, not fear. Instead of fear, anger burned in his eyes. Are you kidding me? The way she treated me? No way. Never, he said decisively. I felt a sense of relief wash over me. Maybe there was more to Eugene than I thought at first. Maybe all he needed was a little push in the right direction. I'm just tired of constantly retreating, he continued. Today I finally defended my position, and it gave me strength. I want to continue in the same spirit. Did you defend your position? What did you do? Did you tell her off? I asked. Lisa? No, I haven't even talked to her. No. It was the first time I spoke out against her father, and he was so surprised that he forgot to fire me, he joked. But the truth is even better. He's not going to let me go. Today he came into the State Street store where I work and called me into his office. I thought my time was up. First, he mentioned that he had talked to Lisa, and she claimed that I had left her. He warned me that she was furious and that I should go home right after work if I knew what was good for me. I felt like a little kid being scolded, ready to respond with a short, yes sir. But I stopped and thought about what Chase would do in this situation. When I met his eyes, he smiled at me encouragingly. I said, I'm sorry, but I can't fulfill this request, sir. She cheated on me repeatedly and I reached my limit. His reaction was so violent that I thought he was going to choke on his cigar. Chase. I can't tell you how nice it was to finally stand up to someone, especially my father-in-law. He's the scariest guy I know after you, of course, he said. His words made me smile. I've never considered myself intimidating. Well done, I replied. In general, when I asked him if I would be fired, he said no. He mentioned that he never interferes with the personal lives of his employees. Chase... I think he really respected me. When I left his office, he looked at me, smiled and nodded approvingly, as if giving me his consent. That's great, Eugene. It's nice to earn respect, isn't it? Yes, it definitely is. And what's next? Are you asking me to teach you how to fight? Eugene, I don't think I'm the best person to teach you this. I've had my share of defeats. However, there are many places where you can learn. Martial arts schools, self-defense courses, even boxing gyms. If you seriously want to learn, you should turn to a professional. Maybe you're right, he replied. We chatted for another hour, after which he called Tony to pay the bill and left. He seems to be in high spirits right now. Maybe he'll surprise us and turn out to be a decent guy. Looking at the time, I realized that it was time for me to leave. I have plans for the evening with Mel. Ah, Mel, short for Melanie, my soulmate. Well, 
in a way. We've been together for six months now and this is my longest relationship to date. She might not be the most stunning girl in town, but her petite figure captivated me. Her sense of humor was a breath of fresh air, a quality I found hard to find in other women. Besides, she was smart and genuinely interested in me. Although I felt a strong connection with her, the word love never entered my vocabulary. I can't say for sure if it's my own limitations or just the right girl has not yet met on my way, but I have never been able to sincerely express my love for any woman. After saying goodbye to Tony, I headed home. I hurried to take a shower, change my clothes, and got to Mel's door just in time. We planned to have dinner, go to the cinema, and then end the evening with intimacy either at her place or at mine. When she opened the door, I was taken aback. Mel was dressed in red, a color that always suited her very well. But it wasn't just the color that caught me off guard, but the outfit itself. In front of me stood a stunning girl dressed in scarlet. A corset made of red satin clung to her every curve, emphasizing the shape of an hourglass. The ensemble was completed with red shoes with four-inch heels, which further emphasized the charm of the image in front of me. They say when all the blood flows from the brain to other parts of the body, it becomes difficult to think. I stood with my mouth open, not knowing how long I had been in this state. I vaguely remember how she led me inside, how she delicately unbuttoned my shirt and then my belt buckle. Well, well, Chase, it looks like you're glad to see me, she teased. At that moment, I gathered all my charm and replied, Come on. Mel gently led me towards the bedroom, offering to continue in a more comfortable environment. It really was an amazing night. I only met Eugene the following week. Tony whispered to me as he followed me into the room. Hi, Chase. It had been a whole week since he got out of a difficult situation, but he was still grinning. How are you, Eugene? Are you still enjoying your lonely life? Or has she managed to bring you back? I was waiting for him to tell me that they had reconciled. But he caught me off guard again. I've already said, Chase, that I don't intend to come back. I started the divorce process three days ago. I think she was handed the documents today. She's been calling my phone continuously every five minutes since 11 a.m. I was sure she would show up at the store and make a fuss, but she didn't. Are you really determined to make this decision? Are you really going to get a divorce? Yeah, the process may take some time. My lawyer said she could extend it to a year if she wanted to. I hope she just wants to move on and sign the papers. How did you get together in the first place? She always acted like she was better than everyone else. No offense, Eugene, but you didn't really attract attention. I don't know for sure, he replied after some thought. I worked at the store in the summer and after school in my senior year, she came to see me often. At first, she seemed kind. Maybe she was the only girl who ever showed me kindness. Looking back now, I realized that most likely she was just looking for someone to control, and unfortunately, I was the perfect target. I'll ask, I muttered softly to myself. She started bringing other men into your house. Has she always behaved like this? No, she only did it for the second time just last week. But I had a feeling that she had been unfaithful all this time. She never let me get close to her, always found excuses to go out with her friends and returned late at night with smeared lipstick. She always had disheveled hair and she often left her blouse unbuttoned. Whenever I tried to bring up the subject, she would start making a fuss, so I just kept quiet. I knew she wouldn't change her behavior no matter how much I said. I just shook my head. How long have you been married? I asked. Since the year after graduation. He replied with a shrug. She was the only girl who was kind to me. She didn't even ask if I wanted to get married. She dragged me into a jewelry store, pointed to an engagement ring, and jokingly said that she wanted it. He grinned. And what's next? I asked. It looks like you're really going to get a divorce. What are your plans after that? Are you still going to work for her father? I've been thinking about it, he muses. I'm not sure. Lisa can easily come to the store and harass me whenever she wants. But I'm not sure what I'll do if I leave. 
I started out as a warehouse boy, and when I married Lisa, Mr. Schultz promoted me to manager. But I still feel like I'm just a boy in a warehouse. I started thinking about starting my own business. I asked him if he had any hobbies or skills that could be turned into a profitable venture. At first he was silent, seemingly considering a possible idea. But then, when he looked around to make sure no one was eavesdropping, it became clear that he had something on his mind, but he did not dare to discuss it. Sighing, he confessed, This will only confirm what you already think of me. You'll see me as a mess. I already knew he was a wimp, so nothing he could say would change my mind. What's the matter, Eugene? Do you collect women's panties or something like that? He didn't meet my gaze, instead lowered his head and quickly checked to see if anyone was eavesdropping. Yeah, I'm making doll houses, he muttered. I could hardly contain my laughter, but he saw it perfectly. Yes, I know, he admitted. I bet you think I'm weak-willed, but they are actually quite beautiful. I even made one for the neighbor's daughter and she loves it. For a moment I wondered how it happened that I was sitting next to a man who allowed his wife to kick him out of the house so she could cheat on him, and at the same time build dollhouses. Why have I always found myself in such situations? Why? What's wrong with me? I need a truck to borrow. Do you happen to know anyone who has one? I managed to get into Lisa's house while she was out and pick up the rest of her clothes. But there are a lot of tools and other things left in the garage that I need to get. Unfortunately, I can't afford to rent a truck, as the lawyer took all the money I had as a prepayment. They're demanding a $300 deposit even for a small truck, which I don't have. I hesitated for a moment, wondering if I should continue to help him. In the end, I thought, damn it. Although my father has a pickup truck, he would never let a stranger drive. I can drive but I'd rather do it when your wife isn't around, I said. Yeah, me too, he grumbled. Thanks, Chase, that would be very helpful. How about next Tuesday around 7.30? Lisa will be at her parents' house. At least that's what she always says she does every Tuesday. I've never checked, but I wouldn't be surprised if she has another boyfriend hidden somewhere. I shook my head again. This man had been humiliated for so long that I couldn't understand how he could even have the courage. Yes, I muttered, trying my best to hide my disdain. I knew I had to ask, but I was sure it would work out. When Mel arrived that weekend with an overnight bag, she stayed until Sunday afternoon. Eugene didn't even cross my mind at that time. It wasn't until Tuesday morning that I remembered I needed to borrow Dad's truck. After work I went to my parents, picked up the pickup truck and drove to Plato's to meet Eugene. We drove past his house to check if there was any activity there. There was only one light on, but Eugene noticed that his future ex always left the light on in the kitchen when she left. He picked up the garage door remote control and was surprised to find that it was still working. It seemed like she was still hoping that he would come back. When the door opened, the headlights illuminated the empty space where Lisa's car usually stood. But it wasn't until the overhead light came on that I noticed that Eugene had everything he needed to work with wood. The garage was small but perfectly organized and orderly. Turning off the ignition, I got out of the truck to take a closer look at it. The tools, although light, were of excellent quality. Wow, Eugene, you're doing great here, I said. Thank you, I have a passion for this business, he replied. When I looked at the shelves above, my eyes darted. Despite the fact that when I mentioned my hobby, I immediately thought of dollhouses. What I saw did not match my expectations. They weren't dollhouses. The miniature houses were executed with a precision that could rival even the most skilled carpenter or cabinet maker. Did you really make them by hand, Eugene? I asked admiringly. Yes, I've always liked making dollhouses, he replied. You really need to come up with a more appropriate name for them than dollhouses, I said. They're just amazing. Eugene smiled and thanked me, saying that his wife, Lisa, had teased him for playing dollhouses. It was nice that someone finally appreciated his work. After loading his tools, we grabbed some thick blankets to protect the dollhouses during transportation. Then we drove to the storage room he rented, unloaded our belongings, 
and headed to the Plato, where his car was parked. I suggested we stop and have a drink, since it wasn't night yet. He agreed, and we went inside, where two cold beers were waiting for us. I know someone who could help you, I said to Eugene. My girlfriend Mel has a bachelor's degree in marketing. Will she agree to help develop a marketing plan for dollhouses? I said. Do you really think so? He asked. Maybe you can make money selling them, I said. After all, they are very cute. How long does it take to build one? I asked. It usually takes a couple of days, maybe three for the more difficult ones, he explained. Well, I wouldn't quit my main job yet, I cautioned. I'll talk to Mel this weekend and get her opinion. After finishing our beer, we went home. Eugene was still living in the motel, but had already mentioned his plans to find a small apartment. I should have praised him for his perseverance. Mel called me on Thursday. From time to time, she went out for a drink with her friends on a Friday night. The upcoming Friday was one of those evenings. I was a little disappointed since our weekend usually started on Friday night, but it gave me a little time to plan a surprise for her. The previous weekend, she surprised me by showing up at my door with a suitcase and spending the whole weekend with me. The week before, she met me at her house in stunning red underwear. I needed to cook something special for Mel, but since I won't see her until the next day, I decided to stop by Plato's on my way home from work on Friday. Hey Tony, I asked, do you know anyone who has a great recipe for Eggs Benedict? Mel loved this dish for breakfast, but she was very scrupulous about how she liked to cook it, so she didn't order it often. Actually, Tony replied, I know. I would love to cook a delicious breakfast. Then you should use real Canadian bacon when cooking, not ham, to ensure the best taste. The eggs should be hard-boiled so that the yolks remain insoluble and perfectly combine with the tart hollandaise sauce. To top it all off, black olive is added for an extra splash of flavor. Tony, you described this recipe very well. Could you record it for me? I will be very happy to pay you for your help. Consider it a favor. You help a friend, and I return the favor. This is similar to the concept of paying in advance. The next day, I drove up to Mel's house and double-checked the grocery bags to make sure I had everything I needed. I hesitated for a moment before deciding whether to ring the doorbell. I thought that after a night spent with friends, she would not refuse to sleep. But at the same time, I did not want to wait too long and risk missing her. As a result, I waited until half past eight in the morning before pressing the doorbell. After a moment, I noticed how the peephole in the door went dark. She was hiding behind the door waiting for me to come in. When I stepped inside, the door closed behind me, and I saw that my beloved girl was standing there in her underwear. She was yawning, covering her mouth with her hand, and her eyes were half closed. It was an incredible sight. I put the bags on the floor, went up to her and kissed her. She wrapped her arms around my neck and smiled sleepily. Why are you taking so long? She whispered. I smiled, realizing what a wonderful woman she was. Do you want to eat before or after? I asked. Before, she said with difficulty, trying to wake up. Okay, why don't you jump in the shower to wake up, and I'll start cooking breakfast, I suggested. Okay, she replied, yawning again. What are you cooking? What is it? She asked. Surprise, I replied, grabbing the bags and heading to the kitchen. Following Tony's recipe, I was almost done when Mel came downstairs, looking more cheerful than before. What time did you get home? I asked, putting a plate of perfectly cooked eggs Benedict in front of her. Oh, they look amazing, darling. I didn't know you were such a gourmet, she remarked. I hope you like it. I replied, sitting down with my plate. Savoring the first bite, she finally answered my question. I only came in after two. These eggs are fantastic, thank you. Is everything okay? You don't usually come home this late after a night out with the girls. No, she replied. I'm doing well, but unfortunately Nancy is going through a difficult time. She recently found out that her husband was unfaithful, and she is completely heartbroken. We all stayed late to support her and try to cheer her up. I am sincerely worried about her because it seems that her world has collapsed. 
This is the tall blonde who works in the office next to yours. Suddenly she looked up at me and said, No more questions. I'm not for anything and I won't give anyone a man who cooks so well. I couldn't help but smile at her playful remark. I realized she was joking, but it was still nice to listen to her. As we ate dinner we discussed her friend. The mention of an unfaithful husband made me think of Eugene and dollhouses. I said I needed to ask her something before I forgot. I told her that I have a friend who is a masterful wooden dollhouses maker. He hopes to turn his hobby into a profitable business, and I wanted to know if she had any marketing ideas. Do I know your friend? She asked. I've known him since high school but recently we met again. Like Nancy, he is going through a divorce because his wife has been unfaithful for a long time. He has reached his limit. Mel shook her head in disbelief. Why are there so many cheating spouses? Why get married if you're going to cheat? I can't understand it, I said. She chuckled and said, For someone who used to be a player, you have surprisingly traditional values. That's one of the things I admire about you. I didn't know what to say, so I just smiled and shrugged. She smiled back. So he makes wooden dollhouses by hand. How long does it take him to make one? What is it? She asked. He said it takes two to three days. With such deadlines, it would be difficult to maintain a wholesale business, she said. Perhaps retail would be more appropriate. She paused, thinking. Or he could target a niche market by promoting them as unique products through a broker, she suggested. This way he will get more benefit from them. But first I need to look at some of them. I wouldn't have contacted brokers if I didn't understand the situation well. No problem, I assured her. He moved out of his house, but he still has a couple in a warehouse on Dimster. Mel's face lit up mischievously. If I help your friend, I will demand payment for my services, she said. In return, I'm counting on extra time spent with you. I couldn't help but smile. I've never felt so good about paying back a debt. Okay, I said. Let's start right now, she announced. Are you planning to stay the night? Yes, I have clean clothes in the car, I replied. This is my man, Mel, she chuckled. Why don't you call your friend and see if we can meet him tomorrow at the place where he keeps his dollhouses? I'd like to see it. And let's meet you in the bedroom, she added with a sly smile, leaving the kitchen and heading into the hallway. I quickly grabbed the phone and dialed Eugene's number. We agreed to meet at the warehouse the next day at 2 o'clock. As soon as I finished the conversation, I hurried into the bedroom to pay off my debts. It was another unforgettable night with Mel. Eugene was worried sitting in the car when we pulled up. I introduced him to Mel, and he opened the storage room. After examining the creations, Mel reacted the same way as I did when I first saw them. My God, Eugene, did you make them yourself? They're just amazing, she exclaimed. Thank you. I've been doing this since I was a kid. I started building dollhouses about five years ago as a hobby, he replied. Chase was the one who suggested I sell them. After examining the second model, Mel stated, Okay, I've seen enough. How many of these models can you produce in the next two to three weeks? They should be of the same quality level, no flaws. Now I'm faced with a problem. There is no electricity here. I need a workplace with electricity. How much space do you need? It doesn't have to be big. An area like this will be enough. Mel thought for a moment before suggesting that the apartment complex where she lives has garages of similar size with electricity. She rents one of them for her car, which can be temporarily parked on the street while he sets up his workplace. Eugene was overwhelmed with a feeling of great gratitude, and he couldn't stop thanking her. He didn't seem to have encountered many acts of kindness from other people in the past. Realizing this, I jokingly said that I would have to borrow Dad's truck again. The shy Eugene began to show himself again. He hesitantly asked, Do you mind, Chase? I calmed him down by saying, No, not at all. If Mel trusts you enough to leave her Lexus on the street, then I trust you too. Tears welled up in his eyes and he struggled to find the words. I don't know how I can thank you both, he finally managed to say. No one has ever shown me such kindness. After she and I agreed to bring his tools to Mel's, we went out to dinner. 
This man is so sweet, Mel said during the trip. Yes, he's a good guy, I replied. I just wish he had more courage. He was constantly bullied at school, even by children who were younger than him. They did whatever they wanted to him, and he never fought back. His wife kicked him out of her own house to be with her lover, and he just cried and complained about it. I thought he was going to divorce her. Now he's going to. Perhaps I played a role in this decision. I'm proud of him for standing up for himself. Some people don't take conflict well. Not everyone is as strong as you, Chase, she said with a grin. As a joke, I played Tarzan, beat my chest and screamed. This made her laugh a lot and she laughed for a very long time. He may not be cool, but his talent speaks for itself, she said. These dollhouses are really impressive. She paused, carefully considering her next words. Let's not tell him about it yet. I don't want to get his hopes up if it doesn't work out. But I think I know someone who could help him sell them. Jason Trull, an elite broker specializing in unique things for rich people, may be an ideal option for this project. On Tuesday, we moved Eugene's belongings to Mel's compact garage and arranged his collection. Eugene was as excited as a child on Christmas morning. After that, the three of us went to dinner to celebrate the successful move. We briefly discussed dollhouses before Mel changed the subject. So, Eugene, Chase mentioned that you're going through a divorce, she said sympathetically. I'm really sorry to hear that. Is there any chance of reconciliation with his wife? Eugene shook his head. No, none, he replied. Then Mel gave her advice. You know what they say, Eugene. If you fall off a horse, you should immediately get on it. I wondered what she was getting at. Do you have someone special waiting for you? What is it? She asked. Eugene was embarrassed and admitted, No, I've never been able to communicate with women. They don't seem to like me too much. I guess I'm just too shy or something, he muttered. That's nonsense, Mel said. You are a handsome man. All you have to do is prove yourself and give someone the opportunity to get to know you better. I have an idea. I felt like Mel was going to offer something. There's a girl at work that I think you should meet, she suggested. Not Nancy, I interjected, interrupting her train of thought. No, not Nancy. Her husband has returned and is asking for a second chance. I think she's making a mistake by letting him come back into the house, but they're attending marriage counseling right now. Bev, Mr. Jansen's secretary, is pretty, smart, pleasant to talk to, and lonely. I looked at Eugene, who looked scared again, and Mel continued to insist on her idea. Before I could intervene, she offered to arrange a double date with Eugene. I wasn't thrilled at the thought of him joining us, but the invitation had already been made, and I had no choice. Eugene's eyes lit up as soon as he heard this sentence. A double date with you and Chase? Do you really think she'll like me? He asked. Mel was burying us deeper and deeper. I'm not sure, but there's only one way to find out. How about this? I can check if she is available, and if so, we can arrange to meet this Friday. No wonder he readily accepted the offer. Once again I scolded myself for meddling in other people's affairs. Since I couldn't come on Friday night I decided to meet Tony for a beer on Thursday after work. As soon as I sat down at the table, he wasted no time in asking me if I had a new girlfriend. I was taken aback by his question. A new girl? No, why would you think that? Tony leaned closer and said that every night that week a woman came looking for me. After he described her as a woman of medium height, with blonde hair and a few extra pounds, it dawned on me that this must be Lisa. Was Eugene's future ex-wife looking for me? Tony just nodded. The next time she comes, tell her that you haven't seen me and heard that I was hanging out at some other bar, but you don't know which one. Maybe you should tell her yourself. Tony giggled and added, She just came in and is standing right behind you. I turned slightly and greeted her. Hi, Lisa. She sat down on the bar stool next to me. Hi, Chase, she replied. It took me a while, but I finally figured out who you are. I kind of remember you from school. How did you manage to find me? Before answering, she asked for a glass of white wine. You're quite famous in this city, 
I was just making inquiries. Okay, so you found me. What do you need, Lisa? I want to know what makes you think you have the right to interfere in other people's affairs. We were happily married until you intervened. I can't help but grin. You may have been happy with your marriage, but your husband certainly wasn't. I'll ask you a question. Why do you think you can treat him like an empty place? He's my husband. I can treat him as I please. I understand you, but he also has the freedom to leave at any moment, I replied calmly as she vented her displeasure. Her demeanor seemed to soften a little after my answer. Look, Chase, I didn't come here to argue with you. I just want you to tell Eugene that everything is forgiven and he can come home. I know I said hurtful things, but I've changed my mind. I promise to treat him better. I rolled my eyes at her sudden change of mood. Lisa, you know he still works at your dad's grocery store, right? If you want him back, go and tell him yourself. I can't do that. My dad won't let me go into the store to talk to him. He's afraid I'll make a scene. He seems to be mad at me. Listen, Lisa, Eugene has made it clear that he does not intend to reconcile with you. As you have already said, you've ruined everything. It's time to accept this and move on. I agree that I made a mistake, but he respects your opinion. I just want you to tell him that I deserve a second chance. I promise I will treat him better. No more other men. I'm sorry, Lisa, but I doubt your sincerity, and I think Eugene does too. Why should you care? No matter what, you will always be your father's precious daughter. You'll never have to worry about money. There are plenty of men in the world who are ready to do anything in order to feel the luxury that you live. She sighed and slumped her shoulders. I miss him. I miss having him by my side. You should have thought about that before you cheated on him. She looked at me. He wouldn't have left if it wasn't for you. At least, could you say something nice about me? You're wrong, Lisa. I just made it clear to him that he deserves more. He would have left you anyway. Eugene is finally starting to find himself. Leave him alone. Move on and find someone else to poison his life. The anger in her eyes grew stronger as she spoke. This is not the end, she hissed. She abruptly finished her wine in one gulp, got up and left. Tony came up to me impressed. Wow, you really put her in her place, he remarked. Did you hear everything? I asked. Oh yes, every word. Is she really that terrible? Even worse, I grinned. She was very nice just now. I decided to stay and have a couple of beers with Tony until 10 o'clock, and then go home. On Thursday evening, I prefer to go to bed early so that I have enough energy for the weekend. The next evening we gathered at my house, as it was more convenient than meeting at Mel's. Mel brought her friend Bev with her, and Eugene arrived shortly after her. I made drinks for everyone while we chatted and got to know each other before heading to the restaurant. Although I had seen fights in Mel's office several times, I was not familiar with her. Bev turned out to be somewhat withdrawn, which led Mel to think that she and Eugene could be a good couple. While they were chatting, Bev asked about Eugene's dollhouses, which Mel had told her about earlier. At first, Eugene did not want to discuss them, fearing that Bev would find him eccentric as others did. But Mel skillfully pushed him to make revelations, and soon he was enthusiastically sharing the details of his hobby. Dinner went smoothly, and everyone enjoyed the conversation. Both Eugene and Bev seemed to become more open, and Mel nudged me when she noticed them stealing glances at each other. As a result, we went dancing, and Eugene's not-too-dexterous behavior on the dance floor caused Bev to laugh in unison. The evening went quite smoothly, and we decided to repeat it next month. Despite Lisa's futile attempts to reconcile, Eugene was determined to get a divorce. It was obvious that he was really done with his ex. For the first time since I met him, I noticed subtle changes in him, he was starting to feel a little more confident. He continued to work for Lisa's father during the day and spent his evenings in Mel's garage building dollhouses, except on Wednesdays when he attended self-defense classes. On Monday evening, after work, I went to Plato's, and Tony was shocked to see me there. Has something happened? I've never seen you here on Monday, he exclaimed. Hi, Tony, I replied with a forced smile. 
No, I'm just a little upset. I could use a drink and someone to talk to, I sighed. So what's on your mind? He asked. Mel, I spent the weekend with her and all she did was talk about Eugene and his amazing wooden dollhouses. She even helps him sell them. I'm happy for them, but it just upsets me, I grumbled. At that moment, my phone rang. Glancing at the phone screen, I noticed that Mel was calling. She's probably calling to apologize, I told Tony before answering the call. Hi, handsome, Mel greeted me. Hi, Mel, I replied. She quickly explained that she needed to go out of town with Eugene next weekend to visit Jason in New York. Jason was the broker she was talking about when I first asked her for help. Eugene has a solid assortment that he has collected. We brought four houses in different styles to show him, but we can't pack them safely for a plane flight, so we'll have to go there and back, Mel said. Although I don't understand marketing, I was puzzled as to why they had to travel all the way to New York to find someone who would sell these things. But I couldn't argue with her experience and enthusiasm. After all, I was the one who suggested bringing Mel to work. Maybe we could arrange to meet this week evening, I said. It's hard to say for sure now. I'm in talks with Jason about Eugene's brokerage services, and we still need to resolve the housing issue for the trip to New York. I have a lot to do, so I can't promise anything yet. I was beginning to regret dragging Mel into all this. Maybe I'll call you on Wednesday after work, I suggested. I think it's not bad, but I can't give any guarantees, she replied. I see, I said in a frustrated voice. Mel didn't seem to notice the hint of annoyance in my tone, or maybe she just decided to ignore it. After exchanging parting words, I ended the conversation. Tony, who was standing nearby polishing glasses, heard the sad news for me. Mel was planning to go to New York for the weekend. It was disappointing news. Tony tried to defuse the situation by suggesting a possible date with his friend, a charming blonde. I just laughed at his attempt to distract my attention. Mel and I, without saying it outright, have made an unspoken agreement since our third date. Since then, we have been exclusive to each other, and this fact calmed me down and gave me confidence. Thanks, Tony, but I think I'll decline. I can spend one weekend on my own, but I'll make a deal with you. If you catch me poking my nose into my business again, please don't forget to give me a good kick in the ass so that I get better. Tony giggled and looked at me thoughtfully before agreeing. It sounds like a great plan. I promise to keep you in line. Wednesday was a hard day at work, and to make matters worse, Mel wasn't answering her phone. By the time I got home, I was in a terrible mood. But when I got to the door of my apartment, I was pleasantly surprised to see the seductive Mel leaning against the door with a white bag in her hands. I brought Chinese food, she said with a smile. She was like a guiding light in a dark and foggy night. I immediately hugged her, and our lips met in a passionate kiss. Our meeting was unusually stormy, like never before, and in the end we all ran out of strength. Gathering our strength, we went to the kitchen table and had dinner together. I wanted her to stay longer, but she said it was time for her to leave. Before leaving, I reminded her to drive carefully. I didn't get to Tony's house until 9.30 p.m. on Friday. Having no other plans, I worked until late in the evening. I knew that Mel and Eugene had been driving for several hours, and I felt annoyed that she hadn't called to say goodbye before leaving. At about 11 o'clock, I was about to leave when the phone rang. I was curious who could be calling at such a late hour. Hello, beautiful. Are you there already? I asked Mel. Hello, dear. No, we won't arrive in New York until about six in the morning. I started driving, but Eugene got behind the wheel about an hour ago so I could rest. We just passed Youngstown, Ohio. Before I was going to get some sleep, I'd like to call you to chat about something interesting, she said with a grin. I could hear her laughing on the other end of the line. I just wanted to offer you phone sex and Eugene blushed like a tomato, she said, still giggling. Don't worry, Eugene, I'm just kidding, she reassured him. Tell him to cover his ears if he's shy. Wait, he's driving, forget about it, I joked. I just wanted to find out how things were going before the weekend got crazy. 
I probably won't have time to chat with you until next week. Hey baby, I want to wish you and Eugene good luck. Drive carefully and call me when you can. We ended our conversation with a few phone kisses. Tony caught part of my conversation and added, You should definitely marry this girl, Chase. She looks like a real hearth keeper. I replied, If I were one of those who get married, I probably would have proposed to her a few months ago. I guess I'm just one of those guys with a commitment phobia that everyone talks about. I left some money on the counter and went home. For the first time in months, I found myself in bed before midnight on a Friday night. I am determined to rest. It wasn't until the following Monday evening that I heard her again. Hello, handsome. She greeted me. Hi, I'm doing great. How did it go? I asked. She replied, Jason keeps his cards to himself, but this is typical when he negotiates the commission structure, but it seems that he really liked the dollhouses. He said he would let us know by the end of the week. I replied, That's great, honey. I've got my fingers crossed for your deal. I wanted to call you and tell you that we got there, but the long road exhausted me. I'm going to go to bed early because I have to work tomorrow, she said wearily. I could hear the weariness in her voice. Okay, baby. I'm glad you called. I would have been worried if you hadn't called. After saying goodbye, I hung up the phone. Although it was still early for me to go to bed, I decided to grab a beer from the fridge and relax in my lounge chair. Tony's words kept ringing in his head. You have to marry this girl. This thought surprised me, but I couldn't get rid of it. I've witnessed too many of my friends end up in failed marriages. For example, my friend Jack tied the knot with his high school sweetheart, and three years later discovered that she was cheating on him. Furious, Jack tracked down the man she was cheating with in a bar across town. A fight ensued, as a result of which Jack was hospitalized for three weeks after he was beaten not only by a man, but also by his friends who joined him. In addition, Jack's ex-wife received most of their property in the divorce. These days, mentioning his ex-wife's name is like walking on thin ice. He despises her and still harbors thoughts of revenge. With so many uncertainties, the idea of marriage seems too risky. Nevertheless, I don't mind asking her to move in with me. With that thought in mind, I finished my beer and went to bed. On Thursday, having not heard from her, I decided to call her to discuss plans for the weekend. Chase, I was just going to call you, she exclaimed excitedly on the phone, her voice sounding younger than usual. Guess what? I don't know, but it's probably something very good, I grumbled. Oh, it's more than just not bad, it's just fantastic. Jason has not only agreed to represent Eugene's interests, but has already sold two of his houses. Isn't that amazing? Admittedly, this was good news, especially after the long trip to meet him. I tried my best to repeat Mel's excitement. This is wonderful, dear. You should both be proud. You've done a fantastic job, I said, trying to sound more enthusiastic than I really felt. Have you thought about anything interesting this weekend? Maybe we could celebrate your success in a special way? I already have plans, she replied. We meet at Plato's at seven. Then Eugene invites us to dinner and then to a dance. Oh, Chase, we have to dress decently. Not necessarily a suit. You can just wear a sports jacket, okay? A sports jacket? I asked. Yes, he said we'd go to some nice place for dinner. Okay, I muttered to myself. I guess I can put up with Eugene for a couple of hours. When I entered the Plato on Friday evening, Tony greeted me with a nod, indicating that Eugene was already sitting. I glanced toward the booths and saw that Eugene was inviting me to join him, accompanied by Bev. Mel had her back to me, which annoyed me a little. I've always had a strange habit of not sitting with my back to the door. Well, I thought to myself, I can be patient for a while. As I headed for the booth, I couldn't help but notice how often I've been saying this lately. Hello, beautiful, I greeted Mel, sitting down next to her. Wrapping my arm around her, I bent down to kiss her. I've missed you, she whispered. Try to prove it, I replied. Later, she promised. Eugene couldn't wait to share the news. Chase, 
Did Melanie tell you the good news? Yes, she did. Congratulations, I replied. Thank you. I owe it all to you and Melanie, Eugene said, using her full name, which was unusual. I looked at her questioningly. Melanie? Yes, she replied. On the way to New York, he asked me what Mel meant. Eugene added, I think Melanie is a beautiful name, and I asked if she would mind if I called her that. I told him no, as long as he was okay with me calling him Jean, Mel said. I couldn't help but laugh at the situation. All right, so we'll use your full name but shorten his, I replied jokingly. As I glanced up, I noticed Eugene looking towards the bar for the second or third time. Is everything okay? I inquired. No, he answered, not sounding very convincing. Bev also picked up on his behavior. Do you know them? She asked, motioning towards the direction Eugene was looking. I turned my head to see who she was referring to. A man and a woman were seated at the bar, with the man looking somewhat familiar, though he was blocking my view of the woman. Didn't he go to school with us? I asked. Yes, Eugene replied. He was a year ahead of us. He came in with Lisa just as you sat down. Lisa? I inquired. Yes, you probably can't see her, but she's sitting on the other side of him. I noticed the man glancing over at us and chuckling. When Lisa leaned forward and looked in our direction while laughing, it became clear that it was indeed her. They were making it obvious that Eugene was the cause of their amusement. Should I ask Tony to kick them out? I asked. No, I really don't care who she's sleeping with right now. I just thought she had better taste than him, was the reply. Tony was busy and didn't notice when the two of them started approaching our table. I was about to get up, but Eugene said he'd fix it. When they came to our table, I stayed ready just in case. They were both standing next to Eugene and looking down at him. Eugene greeted them with a smile. Hi Eugene, Pete said, pronouncing the name the same way he did at school. Some people just don't want to grow up. Lisa looked at Bev and asked, Who is she? Another one of your fans? Girl 304? Before anyone could respond, Bev blurted back, No, Lisa, I already stole your husband. I wouldn't want to see your clients either. Lisa's expression was priceless, which gave Pete the perfect opportunity to confront Eugene. Eugene, your friend should apologize to my girlfriend for her rude words. Bending down, he grabbed Eugene by the shirt, demanding that he apologize. Eugene jerked his hand away with a quick movement, causing Pete to fall to his knees in pain. Before Pete could react, Eugene was on top of him, exerting enough pressure to cause screams as if his arm had been broken. Lisa, stunned, was on the verge of attacking Eugene when Tony intervened, stopping her. What's going on here? shouted Tony, and I explained to him what was really going on here. I brought him up to speed. This jerk came with Eugene's ex trying to cause trouble. But Eugene seems to have everything under control, Tony, I explained. Eugene released Pete's hand so Tony could lead them to the exit. Come on, both of you. I'll say this politely just once. I want you to leave, and I don't want to see any of you here again, Tony stated firmly. I watched Tony lead them away, and when they reached the bar, Lisa looked back at us with tears in her eyes. At that moment, it dawned on me that, in her twisted way, she really cares about Eugene. I almost felt sorry for her almost. Tony kicked them out, but then surprised us by giving us a free drink. I was really amazed by his generosity. I knew Eugene was practicing self-defense, but he thanked Tony for the drink and apologized to all of us. While we were enjoying the free drinks, it got late. Eugene didn't explain where we were going for dinner, just told us to follow him. After a while, we arrived at Shea Paul's, the most elite and exclusive restaurant within a 50-mile radius. You see, I knew you'd need this sports jacket, Mel said with a smile when the valet opened her door. I quickly grabbed my jacket, put it on, and followed her into the restaurant. Eugene was beaming when he checked in at the maitre d'. We were seated at a table, and Eugene received a wine list. He handed me the wine list, admitting his inexperience in this matter and asking me to help him choose a good bottle. Despite the fact that I was uncomfortable with the possible high prices, 
I realized that I would most likely end up paying the bill. When the evening came to an end, we unanimously agreed that Shea Paul lived up to his reputation. The waiter discreetly placed the bill in a small black leather folder next to Eugene, making me feel anxious for him. After calculating the cost of a bottle of wine and dessert, I realized that the bill would most likely be about $350. Without thinking twice, I offered to contribute to the payment, but before I could offer it, he took four fresh $100 bills out of his wallet and put them in the bill collector, telling the waiter to leave the change. Once again, I was amazed by his generosity. After dinner, we decided to continue the evening at Spigot's, a stylish dance club known for attracting skilled dancers. Although I was confident in my dancing abilities, I couldn't help but worry about Eugene. After we were seated at a table and ordered drinks, I plucked up the courage and asked Mel to dance. As we walked to the dance floor, I heard Eugene ask Bev to dance with him too. While Mel and I were dancing, I noticed that she was looking at Eugene and Bev with a slight laugh. I followed her gaze and saw Eugene effortlessly twirling Bev around the dance floor. It was another surprise for me that evening. Mel noticed my reaction and casually remarked, I gave him some dancing lessons. I couldn't resist answering. Looks like he was a good student. As the evening progressed, our main focus shifted from dancing to table conversations. Eugene shared his plans to leave his job and devote himself to creating dollhouses on a permanent basis. I was happy for him, but at the same time, I had the feeling that he was in a hurry and risked financial instability. I wanted to express my point of view and gently suggested, Eugene, of course I admire your passion, but didn't you think that this guy wouldn't be able to make enough sales? Maybe you should reconsider your decision to quit your job, at least for now. I was shocked by Mel's unexpected support for his plans, because she was usually a rational and balanced girl. Chase, Jason's orders are already coming in, she told me. Okay, but you mentioned that you can only produce three pieces a week, right? And according to Mel, this guy takes a significant portion of the profits. Eugene's expression turned serious as he turned to look at Mel. I didn't tell him everything, she admitted. Then Eugene turned back to me, clearly lost in thought. He works as a broker, sells things to the richest people in the world. He recently sold two dollhouses to a Middle Eastern sheikh who owns numerous oil wells. The sheikh bought dollhouses for his two daughters, paying $20,000 for each. When I took a sip from my long neck of beer, the mere mention of the price shocked me. In surprise, I even let the beer through my nose, forming a ridiculous mixture of snot and hops. Mel gave me a quick pat on the back as I reached for a napkin to tidy myself up. With a note of amusement in her voice, she asked, Are you okay? I kept coughing, unable to respond with anything but a nod. The situation was awkward. All eyes were on me. I excused myself and went to the bathroom. As I blew my nose and cleaned myself up, thoughts of $20,000 were constantly spinning in my head. When I returned to the table, I noticed that the waitress had cleaned up while I was gone. I apologized as I sat back down. I'm sorry, Chase. I should have been more gentle about the amount. I knew you weren't aware of my salary, he said. No, no, don't worry, I reassured him. I have already received orders for four more pieces but I need to create a special shipping container for each of them to ensure that they will be well protected during shipment abroad. I'm working on it now. Jason handles the orders and I deliver directly to the customer. Before sending, I receive payment by bank transfer. Melanie organized all this. She's really impressive, he said, looking at her gratefully. I always knew that my girlfriend was a master of her craft, but I never fully realized how talented she was. While we were chatting, I noticed that it had been over a week since we last had sex. It dawned on me that Mel must have wanted this as much as I did, so we decided to break up and go home. I assumed Eugene and Bev would be doing the same thing Mel and I were doing, getting ready to enjoy the rest of the night. I felt proud of all the participants. This evening was just incredible. 
Whether it was the satisfaction of a job well done or a thirst for intimacy, it didn't matter. The night seemed to fly by like a flash. Mel loved hugging after intimacy, and I also felt that I liked it, especially with her. As we lay there, Eugene's words popped into my mind. 20,000, I muttered softly. Mel giggled and nodded her head. Yes, 20,000, but Jason will get 50% of that amount, she clarified. 50% for being just a middleman? I exclaimed in disbelief. He's not just a middleman, Chase. He and several other people are legends in my business. They are the James Bonds of marketing, working with a very exclusive clientele. I first met him at a conference in the city center a couple of years ago. We instantly found a common language, and I ended up spending the whole night with him. Suddenly my whole body tensed up. Mel realized this and looked at me. I must have looked visibly worried because she immediately understood my thoughts. No, I didn't sleep with him in New York, she reassured me. I spent two nights with him at a conference more than two years ago before I met you. I haven't seen him since until last week and our meeting was purely business. She realized that she had calmed me down and continued. Jason usually works for the buyer. When a Maharaja wants a new yacht or a private jet, he contacts Jason, tells him all the details and requirements, and Jason finds the perfect option. He earns up to a million dollars on a single sale. Why does he bother with dollhouses that cost 10000 if he earns so much on larger orders? He focused on dollhouses because big projects don't come around very often. His clients always demand the highest quality and are ready to pay for it at the highest level. Once word of his dollhouses spreads, he will have a steady stream of orders. He can sell hundreds, even thousands, before his customers move on to the next trend. Eugene will be fabulously rich thanks to your idea. What about you? You still don't understand anything. I wasn't going to take anything. I'm helping him for you. But Eugene insists that we both get a small percentage of the company. He wants to give me 10 shares and you too. But this remains between us. He wants to tell you personally. Stocks? Does he already have a company with shares? Yes. We needed to find a way to protect his assets from his ex before the divorce was finalized. We consulted with Jason, and he told us what to do. We created a corporation and officially registered it in the state of Delaware, which is famous for its more lenient corporate rules compared to other states. Then the corporation issued 200 shares, which are currently registered in my name. But when Eugene's divorce is finalized, I will transfer most of the shares to him, except for 10, which he will leave to me. It looks like you were both very busy at the time, the listener remarked. Yes, we've been incredibly busy. I haven't even had a chance to contact you. Our schedule was packed from morning to evening, she said. I think I'll give up his share of the shares. Please tell him to add my shares to yours because you are the one who really deserves them. You'll need to tell Eugene that yourself, dear. He was very insistent on rewarding you for everything you've done for him. In the end... Eugene met me at Plato's a few nights later, and after a few minutes of talking, he agreed with me, although he was very unhappy. We agreed that now he would always buy me a beer. Eugene called Tony over to him and, generously announcing that all the drinks were now on his account, quickly ordered another portion for both of us. After taking a sip of beer, he turned the conversation to a new topic. Can you imagine if Lisa really came to the motel to apologize for that night? To be honest, I'm not too surprised. She looked remorseful when Tony kicked them out that night. What did she say? I replied. Eugene explained. Apparently she had a serious conversation with her father. It seems that he found out about the incident and was extremely upset. She said he had a serious conversation with her. He expressed his disappointment in her, and it was a blow that undoubtedly hurt. He holds an important place in her heart. He seems to have opened her eyes to her behavior towards others, including me, he remarked with a sigh. She's in tears, begging for forgiveness. I've never seen this before. Will you give her another chance? I asked. No, it's too late. Too much has happened between us, he replied. Hardly anyone can change so quickly and completely. I always expected the old lens to reappear, 
Every time she left the house I wondered if she was dating another man, he mused, taking another sip of his beer. No, but maybe she will show respect to her future husband. Months passed, and everything went on as usual. Lisa is a thing of the past. The divorce was finalized and she no longer had anything to do with Eugene's thriving business. Money flowed freely, Eugene and Mel reaped the benefits. As for me, I had a stable job, a new car, and a cozy apartment. These were the things that mattered to me, and I worked hard to achieve them. If I wanted something else, I knew that I would have to work for it myself. Nevertheless, I appreciated the occasional free beer. And then Mel called me. She was worried and insisted that we needed to talk, but didn't want to reveal the reason over the phone. I made an appointment to meet her after work at Plato. Arriving a few minutes early, I had already ordered two beers when she came in. I moved over to make room for her next to me, but she chose to sit on the opposite side of the booth. Hi. She smiled nervously, reaching for her beer bottle. Hi, I replied, not knowing whether to return the smile. A feeling of anxiety began to creep into my soul. Mel couldn't seem to meet my gaze, twisting her napkin convulsively as she spoke. Chase, there are no easy ways, I heard Mel say when I was deep in thought, trying to figure out the situation. Eugene's unexpected appearance took me by surprise, and I didn't even notice him until he was next to us. Mel and I turned to look at him at the same time. Mel's tone was slightly annoyed as she addressed him. What are you doing here? I said I'd deal with it. Eugene replied confidently. Did you really think that I would let you meet him alone? When Mel moved over to make room for Eugene, I felt that something was wrong. Mel should have been sitting next to me, not him. It didn't take me long to figure out what was going to happen. I couldn't help myself, but anger seeped into my voice. Are you both betraying me? I growled. Eugene jumped up hurriedly trying to calm me down. No, Chase. We would never do that to you. But we discussed something, Chase. We want to see what happens between us next, Mel said. My gaze shifted to her. Chase, you're a wonderful person. It really is but it's clear that it's hard for you to come to terms with the idea of a serious relationship. Despite the fact that we have spent many unforgettable moments together over the past year, we have not developed as a couple. I want more. I need a partner who will fully devote himself to me, someone who will always be by my side. I dream of a family, children, and a house with a white fence. Chase, I want all of this. As I listened to these words, my anger continued to grow. I turned back to Eugene and asked him, What about Bev? Didn't you have a relationship? Are you really going to end your relationship with her just like that? Chase, she's dating two other guys. It's clear that she doesn't have any real feelings for me. When I tried to end the relationship with her, she just replied, Okay. And that was the end of it. I sat in disbelief, unable to comprehend what I had just heard. Chase, I know what you're thinking, but you're wrong. Eugene and I didn't have any intimacy. We kissed for the first time only last night, but we spend a lot of time together at work and realize that we have a lot in common. We both want the same thing in life, and I appreciate our friendship without any benefits, Mel said. I feel the same way, Chase, Eugene chimed in. I hope this doesn't change our friendship. I've been thinking about my nature and realized that I don't like to think carefully about all the points of a situation before I act. I tend to act impulsively, following my instincts at the most crucial moment. And now all I saw was that the friend I supported and my girlfriend betrayed me. It felt like cheating, and it hurt. I wish you both all the best in your future together, I muttered bitterly, getting up from my seat. I threw the tin on the table and said, I'll pay for my own drinks. I continued with all the malice I could muster. Don't you dare call me your friend anymore. Don't give me a helping hand. Don't come to my place. From now on, I don't want to have anything to do with any of you. And Eugene, if you even try to contact me or approach me no matter how cool you think you are, I swear I will beat the shit out of you. I'm serious. Chase, wait, please, Mel shouted when I was already leaving. I didn't even pay attention to Tony, who called my name when I left, 
unable to answer him. I just had to leave. Tears filled my eyes as I drove home, a feeling I had never felt before because of a woman. Stop crying, I scolded myself. She's just another 304. Once at home, I hurried to get a cold beer from the fridge. The pain I felt was overwhelming as I took a few sips of beer and my mind was engulfed in a whirlwind of emotions. I wasn't sure if it was worth fighting for her. I was wondering if I should go back and confess my love. Did I really love her? I was sure I was enjoying being close to her, but is that synonymous with love? It must be considering the pain I was in. But if I really loved her, could I fulfill her wishes? That was the main idea, and to be honest, I wasn't sure of the answer. After two more beers and a steady stream of unanswered questions, I eventually fell asleep in my chair. Despite the fact that I had to work the next day, on Friday, I decided to do something unusual. It's been years since I last went camping, but I threw my tent and trusty fishing rod into the trunk of my car and hit the road. Some might call me weird for preferring solitude to company when I feel bad, but that's how I handle it. Instead of drowning my sorrows in beer, I preferred the peace and quiet of nature. I found a serene place along the Vermilion River, set up camp and even managed to have dinner. Because of the heat, it was difficult to sleep in a tent, so that night I decided to settle in a hammock. Being surrounded by nature has helped me to take a fresh look at things. Leaning back with my hands behind my head, I stared at the night sky. The stars were shining brightly, and a chorus of crickets sang their love songs to me. The gentle ripples of the azure waters added peace to the night. At this point, I finally found the answer to my question. Did I really love Mel? I had to be honest with myself. The truth was, I didn't love her the way she deserved to be loved. If I loved her, I would have been by her side and fought for our relationship to be strong. But deep down, I knew she was right. It felt like cheating, especially considering that I was the one who brought them together from the very beginning. The loss of a girlfriend can be an impetus for deep introspection. It made me realize that my perspective on relationships is changing. The idea of settling down and getting married no longer scared me. Mel was the closest thing to falling in love, and it made me believe that there was someone in the world I needed. Someone worth fighting for. Someone I want to spend the rest of my life with. Almost two months had passed when I finally visited Plato again. I don't know exactly why I took so long. Maybe I just didn't want to go back to where everything went wrong. When Tony saw me at the door, his expression was one of surprise. Wow, you're still alive, he exclaimed, putting a glass of beer in front of me. I've already stopped waiting for you to come back, he confessed. No, I'm still holding on. I just haven't been very sociable lately, I guess, I replied. I can understand that, Tony nodded. I would be upset too. If anything, Mel cried her eyes out after you left that night. I knew Tony was trying to comfort me, but his words didn't make me feel any better. No, that's not true. She was right. Tony, Mel wants a home life, and she knew I'd never be able to give it to her. We had such a good time together in the bedroom that it's hard to part with it, I confessed. I noticed Tony's smile. I knew you'd change your mind, he said. She's been here a few times since then. Really? Yeah, they're still together as far as I know. She asked me if I thought you'd ever forgive her. And what did you tell her? It must have been a shock to you. I know you must have felt cheated, especially by Eugene. But I told her that in time, when the pain subsides, you will be able to look at the situation intelligently and understand that they did not want to hurt you. I also reminded her of what she already knew, that you are a tough guy, and I believed that in time you would forgive them and maybe even become a friend again. I must admit, when you stopped coming, I started to worry that maybe I had misjudged you. You're a smart guy, Tony. I just needed to be alone to think about it. I wasn't ready to share my feelings with anyone, not even you. If I see Mel again, can I tell her that you've forgiven her? I know it will mean a lot to her. I thought for a moment before finally answering him. The thought of leaving her in suspense flashed through my mind, but I quickly dismissed the thought. Of course, 
I replied to him. He grinned back, confirming my decision. You're a decent guy, Chase, he remarked. He seemed quite satisfied with our previous conversation about Mel and Eugene, because now he leaned closer, resting his chin on the bar. Since we haven't seen each other for a very long time, who are you spending the nights with now? I grinned at his restrained manner. No one, Tony, absolutely no one. But I need to come out into the light again. My self-isolation is coming to an end today, I said, and banged my fist on the bar. By the end of the next week, I went on a date with Charlene, a sweet girl I met at the grocery store. However, it turned out that I didn't like it. She just wanted to talk, even in intimate moments. Behind Charlene came Sandy, Michelle, and Eva. And then there was Carol, who had an insatiable appetite. She visited me three or four times a week, driving me to exhaustion, after which I felt completely exhausted. But how can you be exhausted? It's been seven months since the night Mel and Eugene talked about their relationship. I was sitting on my usual bar stool and listening to Tony's dreams that one day he would become the owner of the bar, when suddenly he fell silent, staring somewhere behind me. I turned to see what had caught his attention. He was no longer slouching, his posture radiating confidence rather than arrogance as he took a seat next to me. I was still looking at Eugene uncertainly while he was talking to me. I sat in silence, considering my next steps. I saw your car in the parking lot when I was passing through, he mentioned. I'm glad for you, I replied, looking straight ahead. Mel said you forgave her. I guess it doesn't concern me, does it? I was still silent. I love her, Chase, and she loves me, he continued. I remained silent. I'm really sorry, Chase. Truth. I'm sorry it was Mel. I wish it was someone else because I know you cared about her, but would you marry her? Were you ready to spend your whole life with her, start a family and build a house together? I guess we'll never know, right? I spat, feeling like a jerk. But at the moment, I didn't care. Of course, I knew that eventually I would have to wish them a happy life together. But now I needed to vent my emotions. I heard him sigh. When Mel said that you were ready for forgiveness, I hoped that this also applies to me. You're the only real friend I've ever had. We're getting married next May, he said, taking something out of his wallet. I left my number on a business card, he said, putting the business card on the bar. I know that my request may seem impertinent, but I hope that you will agree to become my best man. His request took me by surprise. Looking into his eyes, I noticed that tears welled up in his eyes. I hope that in time you will find the strength in your heart to forgive me, Chase. With that, he headed for the door, wiping away his tears as he went. Tony was silent, not taking his eyes off me. Do you think I should do this? I asked. It's not for me to decide, he replied. You know, part of me almost wishes they'd go behind my back and betray me. Then at least I would have a reason to be offended. But no, they acted nobly and turned to me before taking any action. Yeah, Tony said. I picked up the business card. I'll think about it, okay? I said. Tony smiled knowingly. But I know one thing for sure. I know I've said this countless times, but I'm talking about it now more than ever. I will never interfere in other people's business again. Just as I was about to finish my thought, a woman's voice suddenly pierced the air, demanding that someone let her go. I turned around and saw a woman desperately trying to free herself from a man who was holding her wrist tightly. Despite her best efforts, she couldn't get free. Without thinking, I shouted, Hey! And he hurried to them, demanding that he let her go. The photos really interested me. Surprisingly, I didn't look so bad in a formal suit. Therefore, it is not surprising that in the end I agreed to be Eugene's best man. Eugene was visibly nervous during the wedding when I got up to give my speech. Now you're probably wondering what happened that night at the Play-Doh. Even though I vowed never to get involved in situations like this again, I couldn't just stand by when I saw a man abusing a woman. Her name was Rita, and it turned out that this man was her abusive boyfriend. Finally, she reached the limit and decided to kick him out, 
but he forcefully grabbed her wrist and threatened to take her home to harm her. He was very brave when it came to hurting women, but Tony and I weren't going to let him get away with it. Together, we escorted him out the door. As he left for his car, he vowed to take revenge on Rita. When he left, we returned and saw that Rita was trembling with fear. Tony hurried to get her some water, and I tried to calm her down. She was sure that he would return to her apartment and cause chaos, especially since he had a key and free access to come and go as he pleased. It made her feel insecure. I contacted the police and tried to describe the situation to them, but they started interrogating me aggressively. They asked if he was a legitimate tenant and if he had physically harmed her. They asked if there were visible injuries or previous reports of violence. Disappointed, I decided to end the conversation and turned to another person for help. Eugene arrived at Rita's, and when we entered the apartment, we heard a man brawling in the bedroom. Rita stayed in the living room while Eugene and I confronted him as he viciously smashed her clothes with a knife. As we approached him, he suddenly pointed a blade at us. Without hesitation, Eugene quickly performed the trick, as if he were Steven Siegel. Eugene easily turned the attacker over and disarmed him, almost breaking his wrist in the process. I couldn't help but admire Eugene's skill and mentally wanted to know what courses he was taking. Rita quickly collected several garbage bags, into which we stuffed the attacker's clothes, and Eugene took the apartment key from his ring. After giving him strict warning, we sent him on his way so that he would never return. Despite the resolution of the situation, the stress turned out to be too much for the red-haired beauty. She broke down and confessed that she was still afraid of his return. Having no funds for a motel room, I kindly offered her my spare bedroom until she gets back on her feet. Almost a year later, she still lives with me. I want to clarify that after several months spent in the guest room, she moved her clothes to my bedroom. For the first time in my life, I realized that every night I fall asleep thinking about the woman who captured my heart. It was a feeling I had never experienced before, and I knew I was in love. I was finally ready to take the next step in our relationship. When I was rushing to get the engagement ring I had been saving up for so long, I couldn't even believe that I was really going to propose. Everything was planned perfectly. After a romantic dinner at our favorite restaurant on Saturday evening, we will go for a walk along the lake shore under the light of the full moon. There, I will get down on one knee and ask her to spend the rest of her life with me. I'm sure she'll say yes. Eugene has already agreed to be my best man. In addition, I recently learned from a mutual friend that he plans to give Rita and me five shares of his company as a wedding gift. This time, I will not refuse such a generous act.